and you want to attach it very uh, sturdy to your machine itself on both sides. I know not all of you guys can see uh, this from your from your chair, but it would be helpful if, uh, if I held a microphone for you. Yeah, if you don't mind. This zucchini come in there really nice and tightly. And then you just have to crank it. And it's going to make these gorgeous noodles here. We're going to get a little messy with it because it's fun to do that. And we'll get these noodles all over the table. Again, having fun with our food. And in a matter of 30 seconds, you have finished rolling the zucchini into some more beautiful noodles. And on these slides up here, um, you can see some different ways to use that. So we can see spiralized radishes. I know I don't eat enough radishes, but if there was spiralized, I would eat them. <laughs> and then there is a marinated beet salad, or just marinated salads in general. You don't necessarily have to cook these. A lot of times you can just eat it raw and let it marinate in some kind of dressing, which is really fun. Or you can even cook them in a pasta. My favorite way to do it is to mix it 50-50 um, with noodles, and, uh, like grain-based noodle and zucchini noodles. I can make my own pasta dish with white beans and, and spinach and marinara sauce, and you've got this delicious meal. Um, more to come talking about that one too. So, I would love to get two people up here who would like to see who can zoodle the best. And, and we'll give away one of our spiralizers to whoever is the best one. So if you want to raise your hand, yeah, got one here, and who's the second person who wants to win a zoodle? There you go, right there. Come on. Come on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right there. Come on. Shortly, um, you can become a Food for Life instructor and teach other people about nutrition and cooking. And there are over 260 people, instructors around the globe, who are doing this throughout the year. So in honor of them, we're going to wear those aprons. All right, so if you want to grab, yours is already set up. Do you want to try? Oh, both of them are set up. Check, you're amazing. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. And we want to make sure that this hand, your left hand, is holding on the orange, not on the blade, of course. Um, and then your right hand is going to be the one that creates the zucchini. It's okay if the noodles go other places, we're totally fine with that. Um, but we will judge your zucchini noodles and decide which one looks best. Like, who can do this the fastest? I mean, these, these are equal length pieces of zucchini. I think that you guys need to crank like the wind here. Crank like the wind, Chuck says. <laughs> ah, okay. All right, she's had us her strategy. <laughs> And if you feel like we need to do a round two, that's totally fine. All right, so on your marks, get set, go. Oh, we got it. one of them came off, we gotta start again. Pull it down, crank it in. Safety, of course, is important. Play my pipe up your lips. Over here on the right, we're going a little faster. <laughs> I think we've got the winner. <laughs>
Okay, next up on the stage is a gentleman who is, uh, I mean, he is just an extraordinary human being. Uh, when you think about all things plant-based, all things vegan, it's hard not to think about this gentleman's name, and he uh, has really welcomed me into the Physicians Committee fold. He is the founder, he is the man that um, you all came to see tonight. With that, we welcome to the stage, please, Dr. Neil Barnard. Thank you, John. All right, much more to come from Chuck, so thank you. Um, how many of you have already heard me talk about cheese? How many haven't? Okay, well, I'm going to ruin everyone's life today. <laughs> cheese is your thing. Um, I'm going to go down here if you don't mind. Um, there was a survey done at the University of Michigan. And they asked a group of people which foods gave them trouble. In other words, which foods did they have trouble stopping eating and could cut down on losing control. And number five was ice cream. No surprise. Number four was cookies. Number three was chips. Number two was chocolate. But the number one food that gave people trouble was pizza. And I'm going to say it's not the sun-dried tomatoes, <laughs> it's not the olives, it's not even the crust. Is this, is this true? It's that melted yellow asphalt going down your fingers and going into your lap. Uh, there's something about cheese that gets people hooked and you eat more than you would intend it. Well, what's that about? Cheese is something we love that just doesn't love us back. So, what is cheese anyway? And we're going to go to, this is Widmer's Cheese Factory in Thoresk, Wisconsin, up near Milwaukee. And early in the morning, the milk arrives, and it's poured into this waiting pool kind of thing. And in goes bacteria. The, the bacteria are used for what? It's a, to ferment it, give it that nice cheesy smell. And which bacteria do we use? We well, don't want to use just any old bacteria. Between your toes, there are what are called Brevi bacteria, B-R-E-V-I, Brevi bacteria. And if you had a college roommate who didn't wash his or her socks for an extra special long time, what you're smelling is Brevi bacteria that are fermenting the dead skin cells and things and making that odor. So if you want to make cheese have an extra dirty sock smell, you don't use something like Brevi bacteria, that's exactly the genus of bacteria that you use. That's what they use in Munster and the burger and all of these cheeses. Um, am I cheering you up? Okay, so then we need to add rennet to coagulate the cheese, and rennet is an enzyme. Anybody know where rennet comes from? Where does it come from? It comes from, yes, it comes from a calf, the fourth stomach of a slaughtered calf. Now that's creepy, so um, you'll be happy to know that many of the dairies use a genetically engineered rennet. It's either the dead calf or the genetically engineered one. And that uh, causes it to solidify, and then you drain off the water, which is mixed in the whey with protein and water, and that leaves the solid cheese. But you don't want it to keep fermenting, so we sprinkle it with salt. And there's quite a lot of salt that's added to it, and then it's going to be shelf-stable. So what I've done by this process is I've increased the calories, I've increased the protein, I've increased the cholesterol and the fat and the sodium and all that salt that's there. And could this cause weight problems? Well, if you look at what causes obesity and you talk to people about it, they will say sugar, right? So there's, that's the reason kids are obese. And I want to put a question mark on that because if you look at sugar consumption over time, it went up until about 1999. And then you see that what the graph is doing there, it's starting to fall, 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 fall. Um, so sugar overall, and sodas in particular, have been falling for almost 20 years. Is obesity falling? No, it isn't. So I'm gonna say something other than that. Oh yes, there's cheese. The average American consumes 65,000 calories worth of cheese every single year. So, 
well aware of the calories. This is gonna be on the test. Um, those of you who've been in our research studies, I think you have this tattooed on your arm. Um, a gram of sugar has four calories, a gram of fat has nine calories. So if I want to avoid calories, which of these is better to avoid? The fat, the fat obviously. Um, so the leanest beef is about 29% fat, and if I want to get away from all that fat, I switch to chicken. Well, the leanest chicken is about 23%, not a big difference. Uh, fish vary, some are lower, some are higher, but if you look at broccoli and beans and rice and sweet potatoes, really, really low in fat. So they're modest in calories, and that's why people eating these foods tend to lose weight. Well, where is cheese? Is it more like the chicken, more like the beef, more like the beans? What would you say? Higher? Yeah, you're right. Typical cheeses are 70% fat. That's cheddar and monster and all of you right in that same range. Um, if it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. Um, and there is Coke Zero, so you can actually get a sweet taste with no calories at all, but there is no cheddar zero. Okay. Um, well, the other thing is that beans and vegetables have fiber in them, and fiber fills you up, but it has effectively no calories. So there is a lot of fiber in beans. Beans are a fiber champion, but broccoli and apples and oranges, and all of these foods have fiber, except Velveeta is not a plant, so it doesn't have any fiber at all. Okay. So how about sodium? Uh, we're concerned about sodium because sodium, what does it do to your blood pressure? Raises it, right? Sodium also causes your body to retain water. And you can have a little bit of extra water weight, maybe two or three pounds of extra weight just from the sodium holding the water in your body. So an orange has a milligram of sodium, and an apple has two, a brown rice has 20, and a potato has 13. Potato chips, 300. Cheddar has 350. And if it's Edom, it's got 500. And Velveeta, 800 milligrams of sodium in just one single serving. So why does cheese cause weight gain? Because it's 70% fat, it doesn't have any fiber to turn off your appetite, and it's got more sodium than you could ever want, okay? So at the Adventist Health Study, the researchers looked at a group of Seventh-day Adventists. And the reason that Adventists are studied so much is by church teaching, they're supposed to not smoke and avoid alcohol and be, be very health conscious. But some are vegetarian and some are not. And that sets up a really great natural experiment about what's, uh, what are the health benefits of changing your diet. So in the Adventist Health Study 2, they had not quite 61,000 participants and they split them into five groups to pay, depending on the diets that they followed habitually. And the group over on the left, you see that there? They were looking at their body mass index. Familiar with BMI? BMI is your weight, but it's adjusted for how tall you are. And for good health, we would say it should be below about 25. So the group on the left, that's non-vegetarians, typical American meat eaters. And their BMI was not below 25, it was 28.8. The next group is semi-vegetarians who ate meat less than once a week, a little skinnier. Pesco vegetarians, what's that? Okay, fish, but no, uh, no other kind of meat. Uh, the fourth group, lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto meaning milk, ovo meaning eggs. Okay, so they're eating milk, they're eating eggs, but no meat, no fish. But this group over here, vegans, are not people from the planet vegas, these are people who don't eat any animal products, and they are by far the skinniest group. So, but now let me zero in on these two groups at the end. I am gonna suggest that the difference between an ovo-lacto-vegetarian and a vegan is cheese. A Little bit of other dairy, some eggs and so forth, but cheese is a big part of it. And if you calculate the difference there, that's about 13, 14, 15 pounds difference that a person loses when, on average when they go from ovo lacto to vegan, or that they gain if they decide this vegan stuff's okay, but I'd really like to have some Velveeta. Uh, the average ovo lacto weighs 13, 14, 15 pounds more. Okay, so can you get hooked on cheese? Anybody been hooked on cheese in their life? Or you know anybody who was? Well, part of it is salt. 
that salt that they put in to stop the bacterial fermentation. Part of it is grease. It's true. People like greasy, salty things, like potato chips. But it's not just the grease and the salt. You've heard about casomorphins? Casein is the protein in milk. And when it digests, it breaks apart to release compounds called casomorphins. Casein-derived, morphine-like compounds that go to the brain and attach to the very same receptors in the brain that morphine or heroin or Demerol attach to. They're not as strong. Um, here's their chemical structure. This won't be on the test. Um, but they have narcotic activity. And, and by the way, um, did you ever wonder why do people get constipated from eating cheese? They let the cheese bar a little too long, and the next day they're kind of bound up. If you ever had a narcotic painkiller, after surgery, did it do exactly the same thing? In this case, you're putting the narcotics straight into your intestinal tract in the cheese. Okay, so um, the strongest casomorphin is called morphoceptin, and it has about one-tenth the brain receptor binding power compared with pure pharmacy-grade morphine. So it's not enough to get you arrested, but it is just enough to make you say, oh, that was nice. I hope we have some cheese in the refrigerator. I'll pick, better pick some up on the way home. And why people will also say, I could go vegan, except for cheese. Um, it's this sort of addictive thing. Um, and the government is well aware of this. I want to show you some slides that we got from the US government through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, back in 2000, the US government, working with Dairy Management Inc., laid out a plan to trigger cheese craving in American consumers. And they said, these are not my slides, these are US government slides. Um, they separated Americans into enhancers who just sprinkle a little cheese on their salad. They're not interested in these people. And they also, or they split them into enhancers or cravers, and the cravers were the group that opened the refrigerator door, take a big chunk of cheese out and stick it in their mouth. That's the group they wanted to target, because with them, you can double or triple their cheese intake by just stimulating the, the, the craving. So how are we going to do that? We want to target the cheese, trigger the cheese craving. The way they did it was by not putting ads on television or working with ma and pa restaurants here and there. They reasoned, if you want to put your fingers in every community in America, sign contracts with fast food chains and make sure that they put signage and that they behave in a certain way to lead the consumers to cheese. And the first one was Wendy's. So Wendy's, on contract with the US government, released the Cheddar Lovers Bacon Cheeseburger, which sold two and a quarter million pounds of cheese in the promotional period. Um, then they worked with Taco Bell, they worked with Pizza Hut. They, Pizza Hut put an entire pound of cheese on one serving uh, for the ultimate cheese pizza. They worked with Subway to make sure that cheese was uh, an ingredient on every routine sandwich, with no exceptions. Taco Bell would make sure if you're going through the, the drive through they would make a suggestion. Welcome to Taco Bell. Would you like to try a quesadilla today? And these were all done on contract with the U.S. government. Maybe why? Why would the government do, do that? We've got obesity problems, we've got all kinds of health problems. Why would the government promote that? Because by law, the U.S. government must promote American agricultural products. And the, the most noisy group in the head of the line saying promote us is the dairy industry. They're very well organized and have huge checkout programs that make this all happen. Um, did it work? Yes. It worked phenomenally. The average American, actually if you go out to 2017, the average American is consuming, in 2017 hit uh, 35 pounds per person per year and, and projections are that it's gonna be even higher this year. Okay, so can this affect my health? I want to share with you, this is Catherine's story. Catherine Lawrence was an aerospace engineer. She grew up in Louisiana, and she was one of the first people to go into Iraq with the Air Force in 2003, because she designed military bases. And when you're in a war zone, and you're working really hard, as Catherine was, you don't gain any weight. But when she came home, her friend said, what foods did you really miss the most while you were gone? 
And she thought about all of her favorite snacks, especially cheese. And a friend of hers knew that she loved those little macaroni and cheese things and gave her actually an entire case of macaroni and cheese dinners, 48 of them, which she ate one a day for 48 days straight. She gained some weight. Um, and she also started to develop abdominal pain. It got worse and worse and worse, and it was especially bad with her menstrual cycle. So she went to see the gynecologist who scheduled her for a laparoscopy, which if you've ever had this, they make a little incision in your abdomen and look inside with a scope. And the doctor said, we know what you've got. Endometriosis. This is a condition where cells that are inside the uterus start to migrate out and they implant around the abdomen. And it becomes painful and it can lead to infertility. And as time was going on, she was getting worse and worse and worse and they tried various medical treatments and nothing was, was helping her. The doctor said, there's one other thing that we can do and this is going to make this all go away. What's that? We'll just do a hysterectomy. We'll take out your uterus, we'll take out the ovaries and, and the fallopian tubes and everything, and, and this problem's going to be fixed. She said, well, I have, I was, we were thinking about raising a family. Um, can, we, can we wait on this? And she wasn't getting any better. So eventually she agreed, and she scheduled the hysterectomy. But before it happened, a friend of hers said, why don't you make a diet change? Because breast cancer patients taught us a long time ago that if you make diet changes, it affects the hormones that could drive breast cancer. And so she decided to make a diet change. She saw a nutrition expert who said, do a low-fat vegan diet, and this will perhaps help. Uh, right away, she started losing weight, energy started getting better, and her pain started to diminish. Little by little, her pain started to go away. And as the day of the surgery arrived, the doctor said, we've got to do a pre -op, uh, some pre-op exams, and they did a repeat laparoscopy. They looked inside her abdomen. The doctor looked all around and sent her into the recovery room and went out to the waiting room to talk to her husband. The doctor said, this is really amazing. Her endometriosis is practically gone. And her husband said, you know, She's made a big diet change, she went totally vegan, she's been doing really healthy, and she's been getting better ever since. The doctor said, no, 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 no. Foods don't cause endometriosis, and there is no way that a diet change is gonna make it go away. There's only one possibility here. This is a miracle. <laughs> so her chart has written on it, miracle. Anyway, so um, there's Catherine today. She's got three children. She never had the surgery at all. Her endometriosis is gone. And she joined a uh, physician's committee with uh, food, our Food for Life program. She's now an instructor in Dallas and has a center to help other women take control of their biology to the extent that they can. Um, it's really just been a life-changing experience. Okay, so wait a minute. We've been talking about cheese and we've been, been talking about hormones.